Hey guys, Tyler here, and this is the Garage Warrior podcast and video cast. I'm super excited today to have on the call with me, Steve Cotter. How's it going today, Steve? It's going great. I really appreciate you taking the time to get on the call, and uh, we're going to talk about some crazy stuff. If you guys don't know who Steve Cotter is, Steve, maybe you can give us just like a 50,000-mile view. Who are you, and what are you hoping to teach people? Uh, who I am is I am who I am, <laughs> and that's all that I am. You're like Popeye. Uh, what I teach people, uh, a better word is to say what I share, is I share my experience. I share my life experience. Um, the vehicle I've been using is related to fitness and wealth. Um, you know, so a, a typical Steve Cotter offering might be a kettlebell workshop, for example, or a kettlebell certification course. Uh, that, that's part of what I do. That, that takes up a lot of my time. Um, I also do lectures at various um, symposiums. Sometimes there may be medical professionals in that audience. Most times it'll be fitness professionals, such as a such as a fitness expo. Uh, but it's all related around teaching, and it's all related around fitness. Um, however, you know, with the mind is with the body is the mind. So it's really the mind and the body working together. And I basically just earn my living doing what I enjoy is what it comes down to. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that, that makes two of us, man. And I'm really excited to have you on the call because um, you're one of the guys I've been following, believe it or not, for more than a decade now because I was an early adopter of the RKC movement and okay. um, absolutely loved the stuff that you did there, especially with um, the marriage of mobility and strength at the same time. And so I'm sure we'll be able to talk about that a lot more later. Um, I want to ask you first. How did you discover the kettlebell? Because you were one of the first guys around to really get into kettlebell training. Well, w when you look back and it's all said and done, there's what you can call historical data points, points in time. And when you tell history, like there's an ethics to, to our profession. There's certain ethics. And one of those ethics that I believe in and I then I actually, you know, uh, talk, talk about is – when you're talking about the history, you have to step aside your own agenda, you know, because most of them were in business. We're making money doing this fitness. You know, I'm not a nonprofit. I don't know if you're a nonprofit, but the majority of people have business interests. So when we start talking about history, we have to recognize the significant figures like Pavel. You can't, for example, you can't have a talk about kettlebell training and not respect Pavel yeah. or, or not give him his, his due justice. And, you know, so it was at a time, to answer your question, Pavel is the person who brought it to the consciousness of, you know, outside of the former Soviet Union communist bloc nations. Right. Outside of that, it didn't have a life. It was, a, a, you know, some high-level athlete seeing who could push the envelope uh, to the highest level, you know, and that was pretty much it. There's no, there's no presence, you know, the older people, you take to the older Russians or Lithuanian people that you may have a chance to come across, they'll all reference, say, oh, I remember that from my youth. Right. Many of them can pick it up and even do some things with it, do some juggles or, you know, but as a part of that culture was from a bygone culture. So when you look, when it's all said and done and the last kettlebell has been snatched, for example... You know, you have to talk about John Duquesne. You have to talk about Pavel. Right, right. You have to talk about Val Valeria Fedorenko and his contributions to kettlebell sport. Sure. You know, probably you have to, honestly, you have to also mention my name for some of the things that I've done as far as bringing it around the world into different audiences. And, and there's other guys. There's guys that have, Russian guys that have been coming. You know, so honestly it was just there was nothing like that before and right. i was a guy that was looking for something i saw the kettlebell it looked interesting and you know just one thing led to another and it was a natural it was a natural connection there sure. so via the kettlebell pavel and i connected and i got involved in sort of the fitness and media with with the internet all that was also very new at that time sure and um, this goes back to a time when CrossFit had one gym in Santa Clara, California, for example. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Santa yeah. Cruz. Exactly. That's actually where I'm at right now. So <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> I remember yeah, that so gym. Everybody was like, what is this? <laughs> it was a particular point in time where there was there was not it was not bodybuilding. It was not <clears throat> kettlebell became a matrix that things could work around. And right. you know, then CrossFit became an entity that launched it even to a larger level. Sure. 
sure. You know, but they're connected from from the beginning, yeah. and you know that's so. I'm like everybody else, actually, when it comes to that. I I saw the kettlebell. Eventually, I got one. I I had it, this idea that it would be cool that I could benefit, and in one one form or another, I've been with kettlebells ever since. You know, different stages. Sometimes more training, sometimes less training. A lot of teaching. Yeah. You know, so it's it's interesting. It's been very interesting. Yeah. And the whole international fitness side of it, just, you know, people around the world that have some fundamentally similar interest. It's really cool. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you was um, you you and I, we both got interested through through Pavel and, and it was really more of a strength bias to that type of kettlebell training. And over the years, you seem to have moved from a strength bias to more of a skill or finesse bias. Can you kind of talk to us about the difference between the two and the different applications? Uh, you say that re- very well, and I, I would agree with that. Well, there's different ways of approaching that answer. If we're talking about my personal journey, that's one thing. And if we're talking about, you know, objectively, just if someone were to come to me as a professional and say, give me your advice, what do you think is the best method for me to follow? I want to do kettlebells, you know, so kind of have to take a broad look at it. Sure. For, you know, so there's there's kind of t- two different ways of answering that question. At a basic level of what you're saying of moving from strength bias to more of a, a fluidity bias or more mobi- mobile bias, um, there's really no bias now. You know, it's more, more people than not are going to have challenges in the mobility side of things, whether you're talking about flexibility, range of motion, whether you're talking about the ability to rotate your joints. Um, but, but that whole genre, which involves movement, um, you know, that's the trend that things are moving towards. So if you look at kettlebell sport as a sport entity, you're talking athletes that are on the level of any sport in existence when it comes to pure work capacity as measured in work per unit of time. When sure. you're talking about work per unit of time, the, the elite kettlebell lifters are, you know, doing work that is going to be hard to replicate in any other sport, at least for that unit of time. You know, marathon runners, of course, are doing even more work. Those guys have tremendous power endurance. But, you know, the RKC, what I would say the RKC and that long fist type of training um, first there's the brand there's the brand name right? hard style that comes from uh, Japanese and Okinawan karate sure. it comes from a, a karate reference of, of being a certain type of uh, way of using your body um, kettlebell sport brought in information that was based on the kettlebell is a fixed unit and therefore, to progress, it's not going to get heavier. So therefore, to progress, you have to do more volume. And so it's reps. It's endurance by nature. You know, because otherwise you're picking up a heavier weight. Right. And you can do that with kettlebells, but it's wasn't uh, – generally, a kettlebell person would have a couple kettlebells. Right. Maybe a 16, a 24, and a 32. That's your training set. So once you're strong with the 32, how do you get more strong is you, you build the power endurance. It's sure. not – you know, otherwise, we're, the stronger you get, now you're starting to move into the realm of powerlifting, which is what's the heaviest thing I can pick up one time. And right. that's not where kettlebells were really, you know, outside of maybe circus strongman demonstrations, that's not really how kettlebells are generally used. The, the sure. classical use is going to be around reps. So in that respect, you know, moving from one to another, it was just having more information. Right. And it's it's the eyes on progress. The eye is on understanding something and getting more value from it, more more use from it. And you know, for my cup of tea, the learning to be more relaxed in the movement is more interesting and more valuable than learning to be more tense. Yeah. I couldn't agree and, more. I, I I did a a good couple of years of doing some gear your voice sports stuff and I have so much respect for the feats they can do. If you've never done it before and you just try with a pair, like say 10 minutes of double jerks with a pair of 16 kilo kettlebells, you'll, you'll still be humbled, you know? And Most, I, most men um, of any strength level will not be able to complete a 10 minute set of long cycle with double 16s. Right. Unless they have at least some slight sense of pacing. Sure. 
Yeah. Um, the strong guys will burn out after four or five minutes. Yeah, you know, there's probably guys that muscle out, but <clears throat> yeah, that's, I mean, <clears throat> that's a great test, 16, 10 minutes, and it gives you an idea because it's not a heavy weight. You'll find out real fast. I like Basically, there's ethical. The point of this of it of the story is that there's ethical responsibilities in every profession and if someone's a fitness professional and charging people to you know they're taking their money in exchange for their time and knowledge and supervision for that period of time be it an hour or a weekend course or whatever the format and one of the most important ethics is not to hurt the people sure. that come to you trusting that you should know more than them and you're actually going to help build them up not tear them down. But, you know, performance is important, but performance isn't rule number one. Rule number one is don't injure the person. And then from there, number two is figure out how to make them better while not injuring them. So, and I think that that if you look around, there's a lot of incidences of negligence just in general okay, and um, not, not being really aware of that. So you know, there's room for growth, you Absolutely. know, but for me personally, that's, the philosophy and, and the values that you have is fundamental to whatever the curriculum is going to be because, you know, then from that, we understand the, the ethics and here's the techniques, here's the starting. Uh, the curriculum is should be the foundational techniques, the techniques that we consider the most important to learn in the beginning sure. and to set a foundation for whatever other things you want to learn on top of that. And you can go in many different directions. So... Of course, there's a standard because it's Steve Cotter, it's IKFF. So we have a standard that is a, as subjective as we can be or as objective as objective as we can be. It's a particular series of tests that they have to complete with, with um, what would be considered safe and effective performance. Right. You know, so there's some criteria in place and, you know, and in addition to that, the community is in my opinion it's its greatest value because you're plugging into folks that have a similar vision similar uh energy similar focus and that's how you get things done you need to have people that come together that have their they have their priorities in order yeah you know? absolutely do you mind sharing any of those tests or basic skills that you like to assess people 